The Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington, D.C. produces billions of dollars or Federal Reserve notes each year for delivery to the Federal Reserve System throughout the nation. The Bureau is part of the U.S. Department of Treasury and has currency production facilities in Washington, D.C. and Fort Worth, Texas. C-SPAN visited the Bureau of Engraving and Printing to learn about the process of creating currency and the craft of engraving. My name is James Brent. I'm chief in the Office of Engraving and I've been in the office for three years at the Bureau for 20 years. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing is responsible for the development and production of United States currency notes. Uh, as its primary function or primary mission, uh, the Bureau prints and processes billions of United States Federal Reserve notes uh, for delivery to the Federal Reserve System. Um, orders are received from the Federal Reserve Board uh, on an annual basis. The Federal Reserve uh, ultimately makes the decision on when notes go into circulation that are provided by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Uh, the Bureau is also responsible for uh, redemption of mutilated currency. Uh, it's a service that's offered to the general public in which um, currency that's been mutilated can be returned in and redeemed uh, for the appropriate uh, value established by the Bureau. The Bureau is also responsible for um, updating. Uh, this is in conjunction with the Federal Reserve Board, United States Secret Service, uh, updating uh, uh, currency every seven to ten years, um, adding additional security features um, to, to help thwart counterfeiting. It's, it's, it, one of the good things about working at the Bureau is it's fascinating to think every day that what we produce here touches everybody. At some point in time, everybody comes in contact with um, paper currency. And it's just fascinating to be a part of that every day. Uh, also a good part of working at the Bureau is the um, people. Um, there's a great deal of pride uh, in the uh, crafts and non-craft uh, labor personnel that, that work here. My name is Joseph Bongiorno. I've been with the Bureau for about 21 years. I'm a plate printer. I uh, started out in currency, went to stamps. We no longer do stamps, but I'm now in the miscellaneous department, which we do all a lot of hand printing, and we do demonstrations on showing how the money used to be printed from 1862 to 1929, all by hand. This is called a spider press. We used to have 600 of them. They used to be in the red brick building up on the corner. At that time, we had about 8,000 employees. We had 600 presses. Each press was manned with two people. The printer does all the whole inking process. We usually had a lady or somebody else on there stay clean to put the paper on, take the paper off. It's a very time-consuming process. When they printed the currency like this back in the 1800s all the way to 1929, <coughs> A good day's work for each printer was like uh, 75 sheets a day, printing eight bills on a plate. A super day was about 100 sheets, and they got paid piecework. If it wasn't good work, they didn't get paid for it. I'm Franklin Nall, and now I'm the historical consultant to the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. The Bureau was interesting in that it was an early employer of, of women. Um, Unlike other banknote companies or other institutions of the time, about 50% of the workforce was female. And often women were seen as naturally suited to this task as it involved cutting things with scissors and wrapping things up and you know, various other 19th century attitudes towards women. But they were also, once they got inside the Bureau, they started to do what would be considered hard industrial work. They're running presses. They are helping printers with their machinery. They are, are doing things that mostly men would be considered to be the, the right people for. Um, they would do heavy lifting and um, there was really some tough, brutal work that they had to do in very, at times, bad conditions. Of course, the 1880 building, no air conditioning. It's August in Washington. Um, the main press room, as everything was done by hand, the ink was rolled out by hand, the ink had to be eat, heated. So every pressman had a small gas heater. So it's August, 
95 degrees, you have about 100 gas heaters running in there and you're wearing Victorian clothing and you survive your apprenticeship. Um, but mostly they were, if you got inside and could do the work, you were paid well. And a lot of women and men spent decades in here. They would spend 20 to 40 years doing the same job um, because it was a good job and uh, they got treated well. You'll also see, even in the photographs at the time, you'll see African Americans in various jobs and they are mentioned from the very beginning uh, inside the Bureau. And the, very, the very first year or two you would see African Americans in the usual jobs that they could get at the time, um, cleaning, things like that. But soon they moved into processing roles, um, such as cutting apart currency, or wrapping up currency, or moving currency around. And they would stay here for a long time and uh, start to move into management positions. So it was very, it's a very interesting place, the, the Bureau. It's, it's kind of always ahead of the rest of society. I'm not sure why that is, unless it's because it's a closed world onto its own and different rules apply. Um, but it's al always been ahead in, in the hiring of women and minorities and them taking leadership positions within the organization. Security was very strict, and it still is. Um, in the early years of the Bureau, because you had uh, printing plates, currency and such floating around. When you got into work in the morning, everybody got locked in. You, had, you did everything inside the building. You ate. Uh, if you wanted to smoke, you went up on the roof and you smoked. And you wouldn't be let out at the end of the day until everything was accounted for. If something was missing, you were required to pay for it. If currency disappeared, you and your mates had to pay for it. And that, that ha went until, I think, the early 20th century. That was the rule. And you'll see on the main building, which is across the street from us, two terraces where people would spend their break times because they were locked in. And uh, it was considered cutting edge uh, technology for the day to have individual terraces for your employees. How about how many people work here? Uh, just under 2,000. Um, specifically, I think the number is right around 1980. This is a combination of craft and non-craft employees. Uh, these employees are located at, we have two facilities. There's a facility in Fort Worth, Texas, which we refer to as the Western Currency Facility. And obviously, the facility that we're at today um, is the DC Currency Facility. Uh, the or currency order is split between both facilities. Normally it's about 60% in Fort Worth, 40% in D.C. Uh, that varies from year to year depending on what denominations are requested and what the volume of the order is. My name is Gary Slatt. I'm a banknote engraver here at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Um, I'm in my 38th year of service and uh, this is what I do here. I inspect and manufacture the U.S. currency plates. Today I'm just inspecting a new hundred dollar note, new hundred dollar plate. This is um, a real currency plate. This is the one hundred dollar face next gen currency that we're in the process of printing now. Uh, there's 32 notes on this sheet. This sheet, this, uh, it prints a 32 note sheet. This uh, plate will get approximately 800,000 uh, impressions off of it before it wears and uh, on a regular basis we continue to make plates. 1s, 5s, 10s, 50s, 20s, 100s, faces and backs. So it's inspected four times before it actually gets to the plate, gets to the press rather, I'm sorry. And um, it's inspected before it's chrome, after it's chrome like it is now, after it's, uh, after it's bent and when it goes on the press. So um, every note is exactly the same. It comes from one master die, which is a note, one singular note, um, and the Secret Service would uh, you know, it's very important for them to have every piece of currency exactly the same to, to uh, beat the counterfeiting that goes on in this, this day and age. This plate, I'll, I'll work on about two and a half hours. I'll look at each note, line for line, cut for cut, and make sure that there's no, no um, imperfections in this plate. 
I look at it with this glass here. Um, this glass is about a three and a half magnification. I, I will look through it and go over the note and look for any scratches uh, that could print. If they print, then that note will, um, that note will have to be taken out. Uh, the sheet may have to be taken out. The, pre the plate may have to be taken off the press, um, which is like in any other factory, when you shut down the press or you stop working, time is money. So, um, so you're, you're looking for scratches, not necessarily imperfections in the lines. I'm looking, well, the imperfections um, are the scratches. Uh, yes, I'm looking for scratches or, or any imperfection that may not have uh, worked out in the electrolytic process in the plate making. Um, so it's a combination of both. Uh, those scratches would end up taking in ink and they would print. Uh, this is an intaglio plate, which is the main premise of our security. It, uh, it's below the surface. The ink is put in the plate. It's rubbed in the plate. It's polished off by a polishing paper on the um, polishing wipers on the press. And uh, the ink is drawn out of the paper, out of the engraving, and onto the paper. That's why our currency has a tactility to it that's uh, different than regular newsprint paper or magazine paper or writing paper. Um, we use 100% uh, linen paper from the Crane Paper Company. This process is called intaglio printing, which is an Italian word that means beneath the surface. And what we're, the reason we say it's beneath the surface because this is a hand engraved plate. One of our engravers across the street took over four months to dig this image into the steel. This is just for demonstration purposes. Then it's a photo of the Capitol, which we do a lot of printing on souvenir cards and we sell them over there at the souvenir desk. This process is very time consuming. Printer takes his heavy base ink, covers the complete image over. This process I'm showing you, you only get one print and then you got to do it all over again for the next one. It's a very time consuming process. Printer covers the complete image over with ink. As he scrapes the ink off, he's pushing the ink down inside the engraving. Every printer had a ball of this cloth on his press. This is actually used in the clothing industry for like hoop skirts and things. It's called crinoline. It's a very coarse material. It has to be coarse just to glide over top the engraving. You cannot use no fine material. It would pull the ink right out of the engraving. Just the weight of my hand, I go over top the engraving. You can see it cleans most of the ink off of there. There's still some ink residue on there. It still needs some more cleaning. Every printer had a ball of this chalk on his press. Puts that chalk on the palm of his hand. What it does, it creates a barrier between the palm of his hand and the ink on the plate because now he has to smooth the ink down inside the engraving with the palm of his hand and the rest of the ink residue comes off on his hand. He actually polishes the plate with the palm of his hand. The engraving now has ink in it. It is ready to be printed. You're going to get one print and then you got to do the whole process all over again to get another one. Printer takes the plate, positions it in the press where he needs it to be. You notice we got the paper in plastic. The reason for that is whenever we do hand printing, we have to take the paper and submerge it in water to soften the fibers in the paper because we only get 11 to 1200 pounds of pressure here and it's not enough pressure to push dry paper in there. So the water actually softens the fibers in the paper to make it easier to push down inside the engraving. Printer just takes one sheet, places it on the press on top of the engraving. All I'm doing is pulling the handle around and the, pre the pressure is pushing the paper down inside the engraving. You get one print. This particular engraving has, is a photo of the Capitol, has 200 people in it, has a couple horses, dogs, carriages, 
It's a pretty impressive engraving. Every sheet that's printed, and even today when we do this kind of printing upstairs, we print a lot of documents and securities for the White House. For every sheet that's printed by hand because you're dealing with wet paper, it's put on a piece of cardboard, a piece of craft paper, a piece of cardboard. At the end of the day, whatever was run on the press, we take it out of the cardboard and craft paper, put it on fresh cardboard, we stack it up in piles, put 400 pounds of weights on it, has to sit for at least a week to dry before we can go ahead and print the other side of the money. Or if we're doing souvenir cards, the same process. And that's the history of how they used to print the money from 1862 to 1929, and we still do this printing just about every day upstairs. Roughly how much money is produced here in a given day? Uh, an amazing amount. 26 million notes, approximately 974 uh, million dollars um, that are produced every day at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Also a little known fact is um, over nine tons of ink are used every day in the production of those 26 million notes I mentioned. Uh, we print probably about five and a half billion notes this year. We printed about nine billion notes or so last year and all according to the Federal Reserve's request for uh, how many notes they're going to need. The Federal Reserve each year uh, takes a, a, a poll or inventory from all of the field banks and they make a determination on what's required for each denomination in any given year. Based on the requirement for denomination, they turn that into a request or an order for the Bureau of Engraving and Printing to produce notes. Um, we don't produce anything unless the um, Fed uh, gives us an order to produce. We made approximately eight, uh, 620 some plates in the year uh, 2009 and we had a 98% proficiency rating. Um, so that's split up between six or seven engravers and uh, at different times so uh, we would all take our turns doing that. This is intertwined with in, um, a what they call original work like engraving a die or engraving securities for uh, any of the government agencies, Treasury Department, or whatever. Well, what kind of original work do you do, or have you done recently? The original work would do, be the master die for this, um, for, for this uh, piece of currency. We have the face, we have, and, this, and this is what the back would look like. Uh, and as a letter and script engraver, my responsibility is to engrave any lettering, um, any kind of script, the signatures, anything but the portrait, pretty much, is our, is our responsibility. There's a hundred dollar bill coming out in April, I, I understand. Could you just use that as an example to explain from A to Z how that happens? Okay, the process of uh, developing a new note or a, um, uh, um, a, a smarter, safer, more secure note, as, as we say here, um, starts with research and development. Uh, it also starts with um, a lot of work, a lot of research in the field uh, through the United States Secret Service and the Federal Reserve Board. Um, there is a group actually established, the Advanced Counterfeit Deterrent Group, that makes decisions as a, um, collectively, uh, makes decisions on additional features and enhancements based on uh, feedback in the field when it comes to counterfeiting. Uh, that research and development process can take uh, anywhere from three to five years. Uh, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing has committed to updating currency denominations every seven to ten years to stay ahead of counterfeiting. Uh, once a decision has been made on all the final features and the Bureau has completed all of the research and development and testing of these features on its equipment, uh, the production process begins. Uh, that production process consists of um, plate printing, which is the actual printing uh, of the image, 32 subject image, on the back of a uh, blank currency sheet. Uh, we wait 72 hours and then we print the faces of that same sheet. Uh, the notes are then inspected at our mechanical exam or automated inspection area, inspection, inspected for any defects or any flaws that, that uh, they come in contact with. Um, at, from that point after inspection, the good notes, the good sheets go forward to our overprinting department and uh, at the overprinting department, this is where the seals and the serial numbers and the 16 subject sheets are cut down to individual notes 
They're also packaged and bundled at this phase of the operation. Uh, moving from the COPE operation, uh, the note will then travel to our note packaging area where it receives a final package. Uh, this is what we call the cash pack, um, and that consists of 16,000 notes uh, in each pack. And this is how these are shipped out to the Federal Reserve. Uh, finally, after that final packaging, uh, the notes travel to one of several uh, Federal Reserve vaults that we have here in the building, uh, where they will stay until the Federal Reserve places an order for a specific denomination of notes. We have a set of designers. We're all in the same union, Local 32 Banknote Engravers Guild. The designers create the design. It would be something along the lines of this. From that design, the Treasury Department okays it, if they like it. Then we go forward and we uh, start engraving a new plate or new die for whatever, whatever the subject could be. Uh, a note like this could take anywhere from six to nine months to do from scratch which is a single one-up piece. It's usually on quarter-inch steel, and uh, from that, impressions are made from it by a group called the Siderographers. It's another craft unto itself, Siderography, and they are able to duplicate a note from one to many. So that way, every single note, like I said before, is exactly the same. Everything we engrave is engraved backwards, we use a tool that is called a graver. It basically looks like this, the same way <clears throat> a plow might furrow through the earth and cut a V-shape, we're displacing metal. That metal, in turn, is obviously three-dimensional below the surface, filled with ink, and then used for printing purposes. Paul Revere used the same tools we, that I'm using today. That's called a graver. This is called a burnisher. This is for taking out scratches or marking something in. There's no ink in it, you know, it looks like a pen, but you can burnish out a scratch by going back over it and hopefully repair a plate so it can, um, can be used for printing. Well, these are a variety of tools that we use, different burnishers, different size points, different measuring devices, gauges. This is a flat tool where this is, this is, a, this is a graver which cuts a V-shaped line this, this one, and this. This is a flat tool which cuts a bottom square cut line. And it's uh, just, a, just a different style tool. And you can see we have several tools and, and everyone seems to have its own little job. It's hard to describe and, uh, right off bat, but every, every tool does have its own design for uh, certain uh, applications. This here is a stone. That's an Indian stone. And it's used for if we have to scrape something out and re-engrave it or repair something, this stone is, uh, is used quite often. Um, this is a burnisher. Here, no, another style burnisher. This burnisher here was given to me by uh, my instructor, and he's, his father made this burnisher. So uh, it, it's a long line, of, um, long line of engravers using this particular tool. It's probably over 100 years old. Um, the engraving craft in itself there's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of family that, through years of engraving, there was um, a picture engraver here, and he had a father and a grandfather who both had 50 years of service. And he has since retired too, Mr. Archer. And my father was a plate printer. Uh, my mother actually worked on a press at the Security Bank in Philadelphia before my father came here in 1950. Um, my brother works here. And several, there's several generations of people in a lot of the crafts at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing that have relatives and have, you know, have a history. The original engravers actually worked across the street in the red brick building on 14th and Independence there, and they worked by the North Light. So when they worked by the North Light, before electricity, <laughs> they worked by the North Light on the top floor of the old building there, they were facing the North, and they had opaque glass in their, um, in the, up to the windows, and it would filter the light, and they, had, uh, they worked by natural light. So how old is this? Does this desk go back? This bench is old, well, probably 100 years old. They, these benches are old. I mean, they're, they're old, old metal benches, and this is the only one I've ever had. We'll show you. This is just, a, just, a, just uh, an example. But we would use a piece of acetate that looks like this. We would trace over our model that may look something like this, but actual size, and we're able to put that down on here 
by using some transfer wax and you burnish it down. From that point forward, we draw it in by hand and we get it perfect to where we need it and then you don't cut with the graver and make it a three dimensional until the very end. So it's all drawn in by hand initially until it gets to the point where it can be cut and engraved to, uh, to hold the ink. probably aren't a lot of government agencies that actually produce something. Um, we produce something every day and we can kind of measure how good we are or, or how, um, how, how bad we may be on any particular day with our level of production, the quality of our product, how much we got done, and, and of course the customer service that we provide to the Federal Reserve Board. This bench over here, now you can see this plate doesn't tend to look as shiny as that one. This plate's getting to be ready to ins be inspected in, in the nickel stage. This is pure nickel. I can still engrave in this plate. I can repair things. I can tap up the back to repair a scratch or a bump. Um, in consideration to this plate here, which is chrome, we were just looking at the $100 face as chrome, and you really can't do a whole lot of uh, um, changes to that. The chrome is on there to um, protect the plate and increase its longevity on the presses across the street. So um, this pure nickel plate you couldn't put on a press, it would get worn out. So I'm looking at that one in chrome and this one in pure nickel and I can repair this plate much more easily. After this plate's inspected, it goes through a process which is called panograph. And you can see that in panograph, uh, there's a it's difficulty to see, but every note has a number of its own and it's a plate number. And in every note that you look at in your wallet, you will see it has its own number, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, four quadrants. And uh, each note, it'll have a plate number on it for accounting purposes. So this also is a much larger plate. This is for our SOI, Super Orloff plate, uh, presses that we've had put in the last several years. And um, uh, this larger bench facilitates me looking at it. So even though this dollar design's been around a while, we still have to keep making plates? Oh yes, oh yes, we still make plates. We have the original die, and we have altos that we, we continue to make, and plates off of those altos. The reason and the one dollar bill hasn't changed, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing is slated to change their currency by demands from the Treasury Department every seven years. So we're constantly making new plates and new master plates and new dies and, and trying to change things to uh, thwart counterfeiting. Um, the one dollar note, although, has not changed because of uh, the lobby for the um, vendors that they use so many one dollar notes that they, that they would have to change over millions of machines. And so that's one reason people ask, why does the one get changed? We're in somewhat of a head-to-head -head battle with the, um, the mint, with the, uh, with the dollar coin, but when was the last time you got a dollar coin? Did you ever get it in change? Do you ever see it? There's not even enough drawers in a cash register for them. So even though long, the longevity of a dollar coin is, is longer than a dollar, a dollar note, people just do not, they've, they've tried it in 1976 um, and, uh, and, and the early 90s. They've tried to, to um, filter in uh, $1 coins to replace the notes and it, the public just won't take them. Nothing against the mint. <laughs> we all work for the same people. But uh, the one dollar note is very important. And you handle dollars all the time. Do you, do you think of it differently? You just casually handle them like everybody else, or do you ever stop and think about it? Sometimes I actually, I actually do look at them. I hold them. Up. One doesn't feel quite right. I'll take, I'll take a look at it and, and feel. But um, yeah, I can, like anything else. I'm, but then on the other other side of that, we see the people here at the bureau. We see so much currency so much all day across in the printing area. You may see 32 notes on a sheet stacked this high. Stacks and stacks and stacks of them, far as you can see down the hallway. But to us, it's just product. I guess if you worked in a donut store, you can only eat so many donuts until you'd like, eat. <laughs> but no, that, that's what it's like. It, it's product in here and it's currency outside for us. You can learn more about the Bureau of Engraving and Printing at moneyfactory.gov.